um, the jungle. The, the jungle. Ida Tarbell, Lincoln Steffens are all names that we associate with muckraking. Now, the progressives inspired by muckrakers, and this becomes the most controversial aspect of progressivism by today's standards. The progressives look to government to, to, to sort of address these problems. Never before had there been an expectation by the people that the government was somehow responsible to fix the greatest defects and problems in society. But the progressives look to government to do that. They look to government to take action. Now, in looking to take action by government, remember this, this entailed um, cleaning government up and making it more responsive to the people and more democratic. So a part of progressivism was identifying problems like child labor and like workplace accidents and like you know other issues, maybe education and other issues. That was a part of progressivism. But another part of progressivism was cleaning up government, making it more democratic, and fundamentally making it more efficient. Scientific management. Let me give you a name. Frederick Taylor. Again, I'm picturing this on the AP test. I'm picturing scientific management. I'm picturing a question about that. I'm picturing the name Frederick Taylor, who was sort of the father of scientific management. And Emily, I'm picturing your glee again when you are able to identify the correct response. Now, in terms of cleaning up government, the progressives proposed a number of things. The initiative, the referendum, um, the recall, ways that the people could break the power of the political bosses, which the progressives saw as being in conjunction with the trust and repressing any kinds of, uh, of reform. You know, um, we also talked about um, uh, progressivism on the local level, the city management level and how the progressives moved for um, you know management by commission rather than elected officials running city, city government commissions of experts expert management for city government particularly in areas that required expert management so we talked a lot about that progressivism on the state level we talked about the issues and i mentioned them before child labor number of hours you work workplace accidents um, old age and survivors benefits, orphans benefits, other issues that kind of were laid bare by industrialization and urbanization. But we eventually got into progressivism on the national level. And when they, we did that took us to Theodore Roosevelt. And we said that Theodore Roosevelt was considered to be certainly the first president of the 20th century and um, a progressive. And we talked about Theodore Roosevelt as a progressive. Incidentally, Theodore Roosevelt's agenda was called the Square Deal, and the Square Deal came into clear vision with the, with the coal strike of 1902. Now most of you wrote extensively of the coal strike, strike of 1902 on your papers, which I haven't read any in a while. I did quite a few over the weekend, but I have to get back at them. Shalini, I've been very, very busy doing this and that, getting grades together. I've got to travel to, to Missouri over the weekend. It's going to set me back terribly. Um, but I'm going to work really hard to get everything that we need done for you, Emily. We're going to, we're going to endeavor to get those done. But, but it's going to take me maybe another week to get um, um, those papers corrected. But nevertheless, um, the coal strike you're familiar with. And, and Roosevelt's coal role in the coal strike, the significant role in that 1902 coal strike, is the threat to use force against capital. Roosevelt threatens to use force against capital. Remember, up until this time, um, Amanda McMurchy, Force had always been used against labor. But Roosevelt kind of breaks with precedent and said, I'll use it against capital in the coal strike. Also in the Roosevelt administration, he pushed for legislation to reform the railroads, the Elkins and Hepburn Acts that you read about and you're familiar with. Um, certainly, dramatically, the Meat Inspection Act and the Pure Food and Drug Act were legislation that were inspired by Upton Sinclair's jungle. And they were part of, of Roosevelt's um, um, administration. Now, remember, Roosevelt turns over the presidency to Taft. Um, that is his chosen successor. Taft, for one reason or another, um, doesn't fully follow what Roosevelt considers to be his agenda. Remember, by the time Taft takes the presidency, there is a distinct division within the Republican Party between the old guard and conservatives and the progressives. 
And I don't know if you, you kind of realize this, that we talk today in every period but the third period about a Harding's election in 1920. But Harding was an old guard conservative Republican, pro-business, high tariff conservative Republican. By the time that Harding was election, elected in 20, the old guard had kind of won. The progressives within the Republican Party had sort of given way to the old guard, and progressivism became part of the Democratic Party. And you can sort of see that, you know, further emerging in the New Deal and then, you know, in modern times as well. But um, Taft, you know, loses favor of Roosevelt, and Roosevelt challenges Taft for the Republican nomination for the presidency in 1912. And when he doesn't get it, he runs as an independent under the progressive, um, you know, uh, party. And Roosevelt is a, 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 a candidate as a progressive for the progressive party. And we said the election of 1912 is a significant one. Woodrow Wilson is the Democratic nominee, the former governor of, of New Jersey. Um, Theodore Roosevelt, the progressive nominee, and Taft, the incumbent president, the Republican nominee, and also Eugene V. Debs. My idol, Eugene V. Debs, who was imprisoned for violating the Espion or the Sedition Act and ran for president for president in 1920 uh, from prison, was also a candidate in the election of 1912. We said in the election of 1912, it really pitted Theodore Roosevelt's new nationalism versus Woodrow Wilson's new freedom. And then fundamentally, the differences between those two agendas had to do with trust the consolidation of business power into monopolistic trust was one of the biggest issues of the time. What do we do about them? And fundamentally, Roosevelt said in the new nationalism, regulate them. And Wilson said, break them up. And many of you wrote extensively about that in your papers, so we won't belabor that too terribly, and if there are those on the internet that, that don't have a further knowledge of it in ways, they could, they could research that if they like, right? So, so um, we know that because the Republicans were divided, you know, with Taft and, and Roosevelt, that Wilson is able to, to win the election, and then once Wilson is elected as president, he is going to pursue what he considers to be his natural agenda, the new freedom, and that included things like lowering tariffs, which Wilson was successful in doing with the Underwood Tariff of 1913. And remember, Ellen, the Underwood Tariff of 1913 was significant in that it reduced tariffs, but it was also significant in that it included an income tax. And the income tax was made constitutional or allowed to be constitutional under the 16th Amendment, which had just recently been passed. The 16th Amendment to the Constitution made the income tax legal. Of course, Nicole, the 17th Amendment to the Constitution did what? You have no idea. Kelly, do you know? When they changed it, it's direct election. Yes, it is the direct election of senators. And of course, Kelly, the 18th Amendment was also progressive. Yes? Uh, prohibition. Now. Prohibition. The 19th Amendment was <laughs> women's suffrage, all right? So the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th Amendment are all generally considered to be progressive amendments. Wow, what is that noise? <laughs> is it an associate of yours? Yes. <laughs> a client. <laughs> Many clients. All right. Now, um, World War I breaks out in 1914. In the, in, in the first you know, several years of, of um, Wilson's administration. And that's the last thing that we talked about. And, 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 and Lindsay, we're coming to a close. We're working hard to, to finish this material up because the kids, of course, they lose interest. Shelaine. But um, they, they are the ones that take the test. So you'd think they'd be happy to, to pay attention. But anyways, the outbreak of, uh, uh, with the outbreak of World War I, um, in Europe, the United States is not involved. World War I breaks out in 1914. The United States does not enter that war until April of 1917. So it takes three years for the United States be to become involved in that war. And at the outset of that war, the United States is absolutely committed to not intervening. Right? Now, what is it that, that, that brings the United States into the war? 